a privilege to have hey and welcome to this leadership lounge and we are privileged to have jim steyer with us and we have a secret uh, guest co-host as well that you're going to meet just in a second so many of you would already uh, know about the european leaders learning community um, it's a community that's been going on now all during COVID, uh, actually where it, where it all started for us, we went online with uh, leadership lounges and, and many other things followed. So uh, this particular month, we have a, um, a theme um, and um, we are looking at work-life balance, um, as I think probably many of us struggle with, so just to juggle all of life and for many also families. Um, so we have had already this month um, an LDX talk, so that's a short like TED talk uh, video. Uh, there was finding your balance and how to know when you're out of balance and what to do about it. And there was Henry from Finland that did that. And we had another one, I was understanding stress. And there was Carrie Webb and Catherine Cohen that did that um, together. And uh, we had an article, Family Life and Ministry, Finding a Rhythm That Fits. And another article, uh, Margins, um, Are Yours Sufficient? That was Steve Mayers that asked that question. So um, if you have friends on base that is not part of the European Leaders Learning Community, then please invite them. Uh, there's this Facebook group, but there's also, you can go to the website and find lots of different um, articles, just all kinds of different um, resources there. But now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Kalinia on board. So I thought as we were having, as we were having Jim, uh, join us. I thought, why not uh, invite you, Kalinia, to, to join being a Brazilian yourself and you've known uh, Jim for many years. So uh, Kalinia, she works as a director for the International DTS Center. And um, so if you're trouble, you know, uh, or questions for your DTSs, then uh, she is the crisis manager there and she can give you, uh, she's full of resources and um, and just an, an amazing woman of God. We have, you've also done a, a master's together and so we've been students together. So it's just great joy to have you with us. So thank you, Kalinia. It's a joy to join you today. And I think we're going to have a great time. Absolutely. I don't know how much of you heard Jim speaking before, but I'm ready to hear some histories and to learn from his wisdom and also from his personal challenges. I love to hear Jimmy because he's really open about himself and you can learn a lot from him. So it's a joy and thank you for having me as a co-host totally. today, Tova. And, and you, are, you are in Europe just now, so that fits perfectly also with the time difference. So you so, are you yeah. us from Switzerland at the moment. So that's yeah. fun. Yeah. I think everybody's in this part of the world since Jimmy is also in Europe. So He's in Europe right now. Perfect time. <laughs> so I think we'll just bring Jim on board now, but then Kalinia, if you could just tell us as we see him, uh, yeah. when when did you two first meet? Well, actually I met Jim Steyer before I met the founder of Y1 Brazil, because I'm a good friend of her daughter, Raquel, and we were in King's Kids together. So many times I used to go to his place and I don't know how many times Raquel was introducing me to him. And this is my friend Carlinha. And when I was there again, oh, this is my friend Carlinha. So I had a good talk around the table. And also I saw Jimmy painting sometimes. Uh -huh. So for me, it's a joy to present him, not just as, as the Y1 founder for Brazil and part of the, the Y1 founder circle today. I don't know how many of you heard, but he was leader for from their missions for many years he's married with pamela and they got they have five kids but for me to introduce jim is to talk about a human being and i love to see him in this way after that we start to work together in y1 brazil i became part of the y1 leadership team as i was the coordinator for dts's in brazil and i could learn and i could meet him in another context so when I think about Jimmy Starr, the first thing that came to my mind is a normal man taking care of his family, painting in his house, and just receiving their her, his daughter and son's friends at home. 
And secondly, as a leader, a founder for the founder from Royal Run Brazil and the great man of God. So I want to invite you to hear Jimmy with these two images in your mind. A normal father and husband plus a great leader. And this mix is what I we're going to talk this afternoon. So Jimmy, it's a joy to have you here. Thank you, Carlinha. <laughs> Uh, Carlinha has really been around a long time. <laughs> At least she can truthfully say that she started when she was just a child. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike false claims to that. That's right. You started with King's Kids, didn't you? Yes, I started with King's yeah. Kids. I became a Christian. I don't came from a, family, a Christian family. So my first steps on faith were through King's Kids, and this was my foundation. Wow, wow. So um, we love to hear, Jim, we love to hear just you, the broad strokes. I know you have two, you two have been along for, around for quite a while here. So just the broad strokes of your YRAP story. I mean, and how did you end up in Brazil? And just before you answer that, I, I should say that, you know, for those that are viewing online right now, it's also going to be recorded and you can find it on the website later on. But if you're on, online right now, you can also ask questions to Jim and we'll try and weave it through, you know, our talk. Uh, or if you have a fun memory of Jim or uh, just an impacting memory for maybe he spoke in your in a school in LCS, then uh, just just tap it in there um, on Facebook as well. But Jim, could you tell us just a little bit about your, your YRAP journey and uh, how you ended up in Brazil as well? Yes, I, I will, Toby. Uh, I came into YWAM in something called mobile training teams. Uh, so we had a training school of 12 weeks. I heard Lauren once call it the first DTS. <laughs> this yeah. is my real secret about it, that I don't want anybody to know is that I never did a DTS because there weren't any when I, when I started. <laughs> and uh, I had a year of great adventures doing that, arrested by the KGB and the Soviet Union, big earthquake in Mexico, all kinds of things happened. Um, but uh, I, almost at the end of that year, I was praying one day in the mountains in Washington State, and God told me that he was calling me to, um, to Latin America. And to me, that just seemed like, seemed terrible. I said, oh, Lord, what an insipid call, because... I didn't want to go to a field where there were already Christians. I wanted to go somewhere that was a big challenge, like the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Hindu world or something, you know. But he was, of course, you don't ever convince God. So uh, not long after that, I was became engaged to Pam, and she was called Latin America as well. And when we were doing her school in Hilo, Hawaii, before Kona ever came, ever existed, um, God began to speak to me about Brazil, and I didn't know how to tell Pam because I, you know, she'd been studying Spanish at university, and, and so I finally got my courage together, and I said, Pam, you know, I, I've been feeling something about Brazil, and she said, Oh, what a relief. I'd been feeling the same thing. <laughs> so glad. And so we were able to, we both got uh, spoken to by the Lord about Brazil at the same time. That's an amazing story. I mean, uh, having studied Spanish and then, oh, should have been Portuguese, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then I, I didn't, I didn't like that I was going to Latin America, you know, but. God knew what my gifts were and what my profile was and what I would actually be good at. And so I'm so glad that we obeyed yeah. what, what he said. And then after God spoke to us, that would have been in November, we, um, we, we were on our way to Brazil by March. We flew into Colombia to be with the leaders there. And then with, and two weeks later, we headed for Brazil on one-way tickets with six dollars in my pocket wow it's amazing yeah. so you landed there and did the ministry just explode it just expanded at once or how how did it all unfold your time in brazil 
No, no, pretty much everybody discouraged us when we first got there. We, we went to a missions uh, a conference for foreign missionaries, like a retreat, just a couple of weeks after we got to Brazil because Lauren was going to be the speaker. You know, and I figured he could introduce us and we'd get a big jump on things. Well, he, we got there and he wasn't there and he, he didn't go because he, the doctor had prohibited him from speaking for seven weeks because he had, he was developing those, uh, uh, you know, he had problems with his vocal cords. So <laughs> we had so many conversations that we could, where people would tell us what we wanted to do just wouldn't work. Oh. And, and, and it was even the Brazilians. Uh, the first guy ever gave us a big offering, sat me one side of the table, he sat on the other, and he would shake his pen like this. And, and then he'd write, he's writing a check for him because he's giving us some money. First Brazilian to give us a big check. And then he'd write a little bit and say, this that you want to do, this is not going to work. <laughs> Every nation has its own calling. And, and you from the United States, you're called to reach the nations. We Brazilians are called to reach Brazil. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't argue with him. I mean, he hadn't signed the check yet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. nobody believed it would work. So we started out. Most of the people that came to YWAM weren't really suitable missionary candidates. I think the church looked at us, and we weren't a Bible college, and we weren't a local church, and we weren't a foreign mission. I think the only category they thought they could fit us into was a drug rehabilitation program. <laughs> they used to send that kind of people to us and all. But, but the, you know, the gospel transforms people. And many of those early people became amazing uh, missionaries. But we, we really had to tough it out. They, they didn't get support, of course. They were more likely to be removed from their church's list of members because they weren't in church. You know, and so... Nobody really understood. So it took uh, some effort to, to start a missions tradition in that country. I'm so glad they were wrong because, <laughs> of, your, because of your obedience and your step of faith, here I am. And yes. it's good to see all the changes that we had in the mindset about sending missionaries in the church in Brazil. We still fighting sometimes, but I'm so glad to, that God proved to them that we are wrong and Brazil is ascending nation right now. So I think you never expect that why when Brazil was becoming what we are today, right? Well, you know, if I'd have judged by the circumstances, I, I would have been very discouraged. But the I, I just tried to hold on to the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think that's that's the fundamental truth, N not really my obedience, because that, well, you know, none mm. of it wasn't perfect <laughs> by far. But the, that, the word of the Lord, we just kept coming back to it. He wants to make Brazilians into missionaries. Mm -hmm. And his word prevailed over the circumstances. Mm. Wow. So today... Just to give it a, a picture, you know, because we are sitting here in Europe, you know, and we also have some some places that are struggling. Uh, it's not exactly totally thriving, and but but where where are you at in Brazil now? I mean, how many let's say bases, ministry, staff? Just to get an idea, um, if you can you can paint that for us. Well, in Brazil, we have about two thousand staff, um, but uh, the you know, it's easier for me if whoever's hosting this leaves Tovi and Carlina. Yeah, there. That I like that better because they're the <laughs> one listening to me. But we we uh, and then we have maybe something not wouldn't be that number, but a, a large number overseas as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in Brazil, I think we have something like seventy bases now. Yeah, we're we'll starting. Uh, yeah. I think we are. This year, with the new bases that we are opening, I think we are around 80. We just start more than five, or in this COVID season, we open more than five bases. I think wow. eight or nine, if I'm not wrong. Fantastic. I keep running into Brazilians. It's just wonderful, you know, so just keep, <laughs> I keep made a big mistake here. 
I made a big mistake here at the Oval. I was talking, and Lynn was interviewing me with a live audience in the chapel. And I said, yeah, there are Brazilians. Everywhere I go, I find Brazilians. I said, they're, they're like cockroaches. You find them everywhere. <laughs> then, uh, I got a little bit of negative feedback on that one, so I oh, won't do that anymore. No, I you just did it again, didn't like you? Bugs. I just met there everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that's I was, in, I was in Cambodia, many Brazilians there. Uh, I was in India, many Brazilians there. I was in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, many Brazilians on staff there at Lausanne. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here on the Oval, many Brazilians there. Yeah. It, it's really tremendous what uh, God's doing. And then some of the ones I most would like to talk about, I can't because of security issues, because yeah. they're right out mm -hmm. there in the hardest places. Yeah. So God knew what he was doing. Yeah. Uh, I didn't always know what he was doing, but he knew what he was doing. Yeah. Amazing. And then later he also became the president of Wyvern for a while and just really championed, you know, the frontiers as well and the unreached and just so yes, appreciated. Yes, in the mid-90s, we, we really weren't very present amongst the unreached. We, we were strong in countries where you could recruit and train, yeah. but not very strong on the frontiers. But in a, just a few years, we became mm -hmm. one of the major players on amongst unreached peoples. That's the, that's the work that really warms my heart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like all of it, but that one, that one. Yeah. I do LTSs, you know, I've done them all over the world. And always a big number of the projects that they do are for the unreached. And I don't even ever talk about it, really. It's something that just is there, you know. Yeah, that's impartation from you, I think, Jim. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So, so, you know how I wanted to go to the hard places? Every one of those worlds I mentioned, we've sent many missionaries to them. So they're doing far more than we could have done. By you multiplied yourself big time through many courses. Um, so Jim, we, we invited you in particular for this, this leadership lounge because you have done so much and you have... Um, uh, you are a husband, you're a father of five, a number of your own children, you have adopted children, and you have multiplied and you're speaking and, and doing so many things. So um, this whole work and life balance, I mean, how um, has it always been like that? Did you have had a good balance uh, with that? Or did you, uh, did you ever burn your candle in both ends? Or how did you get to this place? Or burn my end with both candles. <laughs> Don Steven said that in the meeting. Okay. <laughs> uh, that, well, you know, I did, when we started YWAM in Brazil, I worked very, very hard because, you know, we were like the only ones. Yeah. I, once when I was 30, I, I stood up to speak in a DTS and during my med, my lesson my half of my body went numb i couldn't feel my right side and i thought man this has got to be something in my central mm -hmm. nervous system because it's so bilateral and so i thought maybe it was a stroke but i didn't we didn't have money and i didn't have a car and and it was nighttime and and i couldn't go to i couldn't go to the doctor so I told the school nurse what, or the base nurse what was happening with me. Her name was Juicy. And I went to bed. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and my head hurt. felt like somebody had buried an ax in it. And I, I can remember all night being irritated because somebody was making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. and, and only in the morning when things started to ease up a little bit, I realized it was me groaning with yeah. pain. And... That happened four times in two weeks, mm. and uh, and then then there came this. I got a telegram. Well, I finally got to see a doctor, and I and I he told me to you know same quit traveling, uh, get rid of stress in my life, to have less anxiety, to to un, to work less, and on and on like that. And, and so Pam and I went to a 
compound where some American friends lived and where we could just get away from the base for the weekend because we're going to try to obey the doctor, right? He told me this on Friday. So it was a nice weekend. On Monday night, we went back to the base and there was a telegram waiting for me. And, and it was Eunice. Uh, she went to, she was one, of, I think the first Brazilian to go to, Hila, to Kona with King's Kids. And she said, well, telegrams, you know, they, they, you pay by the word. So I couldn't really tell what she was saying, but it seemed like she was going to give me an offering. So I spent all day Tuesday getting in an international call. And the upshot was that she'd been offered $1,000 to go to the leadership meeting in Thailand. But when she prayed, God told her that the money should go to me if I would go. So God confirmed it. And I won't tell the whole story. It'd take too long for this interview, but. I ended up on a plane with a one-way ticket to Hawaii and no return ticket and no way to go on. And God went providing and providing and providing. And I was at the leaders meeting in Thailand, went on around the world and, and finally got back home. And that really broke our isolation in Brazil. It was a very important trip historically. Um, but also it's interesting to me that I never had another one of those attacks. <laughs> I, I did like the opposite of what the doctor said and obeyed the Lord, but I never had another one of those attacks. It was, I, I, the way I look at it, I took his yoke upon me and he gave me rest. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it did alert me also to that I was probably working too hard. And so I started, you know, spending more time sussing this out in the scriptures and you know if you think about it back then people couldn't extend their day into the night because you know if you don't have electricity pretty much when it gets dark you you're finished yeah. and and uh so i thought you know if you think of the day in three parts morning afternoon and evening or night you probably shouldn't work all three of them you need one of those periods at least for rest and for your family and other things. And also God took, probably told us more times than he told us to work. He told us that observe the Sabbath. And Jesus sort of made that not a law anymore, but he still said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So we need that Sabbath rest every week. And the French, you know, when the, Enlightenment happened. They tried to change the 10 day weeks. It didn't work. There's something about seven days, one day in seven, you should rest. So I, I started doing this. I, I would work two out of the three periods in a day and I would rest at least one day a week. But I also noticed that God, um, God had all these religious festivals for Israel when he, and really, they just got together and had big parties mm -hmm. it, it, and visited family and stuff. So I, I finally decided that it was important to take vacation as well. I didn't really take vacation, but I, I started doing it, learning how to do it. And it was important, especially for our kids, you know, that I had that time with them. So those were kind of practical things. Yeah. But that's not really what sustained me totally. And sustains me to this day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I also work a little bit on physical fitness. I'm not like a fanatic. I'm not in the gym every morning or something. But I I try to stay active, and I that helps. But uh, what really sustains me is the time I spend with the Lord, because you're linking into the source of life. You're filling yourself with divine energy. When you spend time with them. we first got to Brazil, it was so hard for me. There's nothing I liked about it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't talk to anybody. I didn't know what social signals around me were. The food was different. The, the climate was different. We didn't, nobody we knew was around. We're so far away from all of our loved ones. And long language classes, conjugating verbs. Is there anything mm -hmm. worse? And, you know, I, so I, I'll joke about it. I, now, I only joke about it because people remember jokes better than they remember. The, what <laughs> I, I'll say I, 
I had to have two and a half hour quiet times to drag myself up to a level of mild depression. <laughs> and yeah. that was really, that really the truth. But if I hadn't had those two and a half hour quiet times, I wouldn't have made it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so good to hear from you because sometimes we don't know how painful was to face this hard work consequence and how God led you and how you just learned from him. And as I was talking when I was introducing you, you are not just a leader, you're not just a Y1 leader, you are a father, you are a husband, you have so many things that you, you are Gene Steyer and you have many things in your package and many relationships. And one thing that I wanna hear, because you spoke about, let's divide the day in three parts. Do you think this is key to us to find the balance between to work and to rest? Because many times we're just like, oh, we're going to obey God and we're going day after day, hour after hour, we're going to run because we need to go and to save the world and make disciples. But how did you learn to find the balance between when I'm going to rest, when I'm going to work, where I'm going to focus and spending my time? Yes, it's it's a question of your own well-being, but I think even more fundamentally, it's a question of your family and and having friends and you know um, what happens if all you ever do is work is that your soul dries up and and you're just grinding it out and and serving God instead of being a pleasure becomes sort of a very heavy duty. You have to force yourself to do it. And most people can't sustain that for very long. So there have to be times of refreshment. Um, and I think if you do it right as you go along, then you're not going to have these times when you just run away for a year, you know, and, and all that. So you can be far more productive if you move at a pace that you can sustain over time. And also, you know, if you're, if you have peace and, and the joy of the Lord, you your ministry is more effective. You, you can do more in less time. If you're grinding it out, you're not attractive. You don't have the beauty that the grace of God confers on us. And so you don't influence people as much. And you have to work twice as hard to get a tiny little bit of results as opposed to what you can do if you're mm -hmm. really uh, under the anointing. Thank you. I think that makes sense that, you know, I think Christians, I mean, we should be the most attractive people on the face of the earth, right? You know, in the, uh, and because we should be the most free, you know, but it's not always uh, how it's portrayed. Serene is the word that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Jim, I know that, um, you know, we are all different and like doing different things. But for you personally, I mean, what have you found that really recharges you? Um, I, I put in parentheses on my paper, apart from cross-country skiing. <laughs> <laughs> I did have fun cross-country skiing while we were in Norway. Yeah, exactly. I, I wasn't any good at it, but it, it was a way to get out into the forest in the middle of the winter. Norwegians really know how to do winter. And they really enjoy it. So I learned a lot there. You no, know, just to say, Tovi, I'm I'm apostolic in my makeup, you know. So generally, ap uh, uh, people with an apostolic bent are pioneers, and they're generalists by nature because you know they have to know how to do a little bit of everything. So if you're asking for the things I do to relax and unwind, <laughs> it's a long list. <laughs> For about 20 years, I played soccer all the time with Brazilians. And then then for 18 years, I belonged to a tennis club, played tennis three times a week when I was home. And I can't do those things anymore. So now I I, I have a mountain bike and I and I put in some miles on in the mountain bike. It's not as fun as playing tennis or soccer, but it's a lot better exercise. <laughs> <laughs> but I also, you know was always fascinated by fine art and 
And uh, so around in the year 2000, I came home from a trip where I'd actually been with an artist who made his living that way and all fascinated by him. And Pam had arranged uh, oil painting classes. So I asked if I could join her. So around 2000, I started doing oil painting. So I enjoyed doing that. And I also, I'm a fly fisherman. So I like to tie my own flies, which is relaxing to me. Uh, and then I, you know, go out and catch a fish with the fly I tied. So that's satisfying. What I don't do very well is just sit around and do nothing. That's not relaxing to me. So I like to do these different things. Yeah. Thank you. It's so good, Jimmy. And you are talking about how we need to find our source and how we need to learn from God how we do things and how we work. So thinking about Jesus, what can we learn from Jesus' lifestyle about, about a well-balanced life and fruitful life? Because we know he did everything that he was supposed to do. He fulfilled all his purpose and he modeled so many things to us. What can you learn from him about a well-balanced life, between this balance between doing and being and relaxing? How can we learn from him? You know, a lot of it is not in how much you work, but it, how can I put it? Uh, I've asked audiences all over the world how many of them had a good relationship with their father. And usually it's a big majority of Christians. I mean, when we're doing inner healing, it seems like all parents are terrible. But actually, a lot of people, the majority, have had a good relationship with their fathers. And then I'll ask them, what do you remember about your, your relationship with your dad? None of them talk about sitting down and looking in deeply into his eyes and experiencing something transcendental. Nobody even brings that up. They talk about things that they did with their dad. And so I, I think one of the big keys here is you don't do things for God. When I started seeing this, I actually prayed and said this to the Lord. All right, Lord, I'm not doing anything more for you. I'm only going to do things with you. And that includes work. If, if you, if you, will do that and it'll be a true thing where you've got an ear to the Lord and you're you're walking with him and trying to obey him at, as you do your work. You can really enjoy your work and it can become part of your intimacy mm -hmm. with God, part of your friendship with him. But it's not only your work. You know, once I I had had surgery and the doctor wouldn't let me um, work. So I was going fishing, and I'd never gone fishing on a work day before, so I was feeling kind of guilty. I'm thinking mm -hmm. all these people, 120,000 people a day dying and sinking into hell, and I'm going fishing, you know. And I got to the edge of the lake, and I'm taking my stuff out of the car, and God said, Jim, what are you doing? I said, oh, Lord, I'm going fishing, but don't worry, I'm not going to have fun. <laughs> I know it's a work day. <laughs> he says, yeah, but you're going to ruin you're going to ruin my day. That was such a shocking thought to me that I said, what do you mean? And he said, I love you. If you have fun, I have fun. And I saw that I could go fishing with God. I think I caught 60 fish that day or something. <laughs> I don't know if they'll ever believe that because it's a fisherman's tail, you know. <laughs> but I think that's really, really important. That way you... Instead of being heavy, your work can be a real pleasure as you and the Lord produce something mm -hmm. together. And yeah, yeah. Because most work, you know, it's kind of 80% routine and discipline and only 20% inspiration or something like that, you know. Yeah. You're never going to get work that, that you just love every minute. That just doesn't happen. So, it's important that you do it with the Lord. That's sustaining. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's very good. It's. I, I don't think, think I answered Carlina's question. No, it I was good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think sometimes I think just a sense that the Lord He's asking you, like, what brings you pleasure? Even I mean, like, uh, and I thought 
yeah, coming that, down that hill, you know, on cross-country skis, coming down that hill and you feel the wind and the, if the sun is out and just like, yeah, and I part of creating the speed myself. I don't know, you know, it's also that doing and and um, I think, um, yeah, I think it's a good question to to ask now and then. Like, I think even what brings him pleasure, you know, in in uh, mm -hmm. in in living with us in a sense. So I, I love that. It's uh, it's also important, I think, to say here. We really should. I, I mean, I hear a lot of people saying this now, so I don't want to be misunderstood. But we really should not follow our passion. Mm -hmm. we, we should follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that means taking mm -hmm. up your cross daily. Yeah, there, right. There's a lot of sacrifice involved. Yeah. I, I think that thing of following your passion comes out of the values of secular humanism. Mm -hmm. where you, you need to do anything you need to to be happy. Yeah. You know, and above all, be true to yourself and that sort of thing. That's a form of idolatry. So yeah. God will test that. And he'll put you to do things that are difficult for you. But yeah. he'll be with you through that, and he'll be your joy. Mm -hmm. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Yeah. <laughs> when, when I first started out, and I, I had such a tendency to be depressed. And, and if I, it, it dated from when my dad left us, and then I had foot surgery and all that. And I, so I, I could really, what we say in Portuguese is curtir uma fossa. Mm -hmm. You know, I could really enjoy a good pity party. <laughs> um, yeah, but I they gave me a team after I got in YWAM, and I couldn't indulge myself in that because I had to take care of the team, and responsibility is mm -hmm. a big deal to me. And so <laughs> I was reading a book at the time written by um, ah, the guy with the orphans in England, uh, Mueller, George Mueller. Mm -hmm. And, and he, in this book, he, he tells his greatest spiritual secret. And you know what it was? He would get his soul happy in Jesus every day early before he faced the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if he can do that, I can do that. I don't mm -hmm. have to do these things. Mm -hmm. and so I started doing that as a, a life practice. And that's been really foundational for me. Mm -hmm. even more than the balance between work and play and all, all of that is to mm -hmm. every day get a touch of the joy of the Lord. Yeah. And, and that really is sustaining. Really, mm -hmm. that's why it says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's so good, Jim. Um, you oh, see it in movies yeah, and you see it. Oh, well, we don't, we don't run after our passions because that's how people get in trouble. They just do whatever they want. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's true. But when we find God's call for us, it will fit us. You remember yeah. I, I wanted to go out and preach under a tree in some frontier somewhere, and God sent me to Brazil because he knew what would fit me. What moves me to this day is to see somebody that didn't have an opportunity, be have the opportunity, and be... Uh, something imparted to them will they, where they rise up and fulfill their potential. Mm -hmm. That brings me great joy. And that's been sort of the, the heart of our ministry. So yeah. uh, God knew that before I ever did. So it seemed like a sacrifice to me, but God was arranging something that fit me. I like yeah. that, that we find our fit rather than follow mm -hmm. our passion. Yeah, no, that's very good. I mean, you see in almost any movie, you know, right now, and you hear in churches as well, you know, whatever makes you happy, you know, so that's mm -hmm. like, you need to find what makes you happy. And I think uh, it's, it, it's, it's really, it's really tilted. It's upside down. It's more, you know, what, what you do when you sense kind of God's smile, smile or your, you know, or your life in a sense that uh, you find your fit. It doesn't mean it's all easy, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, as a fit. Yeah. Well, Jesus said, if you love your life, you'll lose it. Yeah. The values of secular humanism are, you know, above all, be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do anything you want as long as it does no harm. 
Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Who gets to say if it does harm or not? That's true. Do whatever you need in order to be happy, and nobody has the right to say what's right and what's wrong. That's right. <laughs> Those core values. Yeah. Many Christian young people have well young and old have internalized those and they don't know it so i've been meditating these last few days in romans chapter one this very center problem of humanity is idolatry mm -hmm. well, you know sin is downstream from idolatry mm -hmm. idolatry happens first and then sin somewhere mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. and the biggest idolatry of our day is we want to be our own gods. Mm -hmm. So that's why that phrase, follow your passion, makes yeah. me so uneasy. Mm -hmm. And it, it, if you do that, you'll be frustrated. You, but if you'll buckle down and do the will of God, mm -hmm. it's like a big sacrifice. One day you will wake up and you'll go, what, what happened? Yeah. I'm happy. <laughs> but it has to happen by accident. It, it yeah. can't be from you putting yourself in the center and trying to live your life for that. That's true. He who loses life for my sake will find it. Mm. So good. And so I, that's interesting. Now we're talking about balance, work, life balance, but it comes down to now we're talking about sacrifice, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and going to the center. Uh, so it's... Um, there's no perfect self-help program no. that will allow you to sustain a ministry over decades. Mm -hmm. No matter what techniques you use or, mm -hmm. or strategies, it won't work. There, there has to be true spirituality. Mm -hmm. And usually when we talk about spirituality nowadays, we're not even really talking about spirituality. We'll say, oh, yeah, that person, he's really spiritual. And then you kind of roll your eyes like, you know. So we might even admire him because, you know, he's very strict, but nobody wants to spend their day off with him because he's shot. To, he's, mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't know how to say that in English, but he's. He's upset us. Yeah, he's not. I don't know. Anyway, so the. And the reason for that is because we're not really talking about spirituality. We're mm -hmm. really talking about a, a sort of pallid moralism mm -hmm. where everything's do's and don'ts and correct yeah. actions and, uh, and behavior. And, and, uh, and that's just a, a dead, dead life. Yeah. Yeah. As I'm mean, hearing you, Jimmy, it's, it's so good to see. Because we're just like, we don't have a perfect receipt to follow and to have a well-balanced life, to live out. But it's about to be with Jesus. And I love when you say the best gift that we can give to the nations is the deep of our relationship to God. And one thing that I wanted to highlight, because before we spoke, if you learn to rest in God, if you learn to be with him, if you learn to do life with him is not just about work but it's about everything with him we don't need to take a sabbatical year we don't need to go out for one year because we are talking a lot about burnout this is one of the oh i'm in burnout oh i'm just finding myself oh i'm going to die oh i wanted to give up and we don't have if i can just say we don't have a secret. It's our relationship to God. And while you are talking, I'm just being challenged by how I'm going to do this is in a true spiritual way. How I'm not going to become a religious. And you give so many great tips for us today. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I want to ask you, because we want to keep going. We want to keep moving. We wanted to avoid this burnout situation, but what, what do you think it, it's key? Since we are facing, for example, we are facing this pandemic situation right now. For two years, how did you navigate it? How did you take advantage of this time for your life and to just be with Jesus and to go deep with him? Well, you know, right at the beginning, um, 
we had scheduled a frontier missions meeting and international meeting in Brazil in Sao Paulo. And I was supposed to give the keynote address. But uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a week or two before it was to happen, I was praying and God told me not to go. Mm -hmm. So I called up, well, the organizer came to talk to me and I told him I'll do it, but I'll do it by Zoom because I just, I can't go. And, and uh, so I did that. And two thirds of the people went to that meeting, went back to their home continents with COVID. <laughs> and we almost lost one of our pioneers amongst the Indians, a, a very vital and in shape guy, but he was diabetic and didn't know it. It almost killed him. Oh. And um, my wife, Pam, she has a strange immune system. It comes down mm -hmm. through her family. So she has several of the conditions that make it more likely that COVID would be serious. So I decided from that word of the Lord right on that I would isolate with her. So we did. I wasn't going to leave her alone and I wasn't going to be going out and in and risking her life. So uh, I stayed at home for over a year. That's the first time ever since I got in Wyoming that I didn't get on a plane for uh, like a year and a half. My passport was in the drawer, weeping from rejection. <laughs> <laughs> so that you know, I stayed home and and uh, I did a lot of the cooking and that things because it was a big help to her. And and I caught up on some reading and I did a little bit of writing and I did some painting. I finished a very nice big painting of a cheetah for my granddaughter and. Um, and about right several months into it, I was just gradually gaining a little more weight and a little more weight, you know. I said, I ought to do something about this. So I started working on that, going on long bike rides, because you could go on a bike ride, you didn't get around anybody. Mm -hmm. So I lost a lot of weight and got into better shape. I'm in better shape now than I was when I was 50. Um, so... But the, the biggest thing is I still kept getting up early in the morning and and seeking the Lord before everything got noisy and agitated mm -hmm. and and still finding the joy of the Lord every day. And another thing that's super important is in John chapter 6, Jesus said that he was the bread of life and we needed to feed on him. He is the metaphor mm -hmm. so nobody would ever mm -hmm. forget. But what he meant was, because he says it in the passage, he said, as I live by the Father, so you shall live by me. And if you go through the book of Luke, I challenge you to do this sometime. Just mark every place that it talks about Jesus' prayer life. It's all the time, it's especially in Luke. I don't know why he wrote about it more than the others, but it's there a lot. And so his words weren't his own. He said, I... Don't speak my words, but the words of the Father. His mm -hmm. motives were his own. He said, I didn't come to do my will, but the will of the Father. And and his miracles were his own. His works, he says, I don't didn't come to do my works, but the works of the Father. So, and then, you know, in John, he says, if you will abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it will be done for you. So what makes the Bible turns it from being just a, a document into strength for us. Well, mm -hmm. it has to become the bread of life. And the way we do that is we come to the written word, always accompanied by the eternal logos of John chapter one. And he will, you remember in the road to Emmaus, it's when he broke the bread that they recognized in this. We need to have him break the bread of the word of God. You know, you cannot sustain a lifetime of ministry or any other kind of life as far as that goes without uh, partaking of the bread of life. And, and that happens in a con when the, the written word comes together with the living eternal word of John chapter 1. So uh, we don't go to the Bible to find propositional truth so much as we go to it to find a person. The Bible said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
And so he's, he is the truth. The concept of truth in the Bible is a person, not a certain group of ideas. And when we go to him as the truth, he imparts life to us. Hmm. So these spiritual dynamics are what really sustains us. Yeah. Oh, so good. I was just going to say that's one of my favorite passages because I think so truth, it's not a concept, it's a person, but he, it's also a process because it's the truth, the way and life. So he is showing process in in living. I mean, not, not just truth, but how you do it. And it's dynamic. It's not something yeah. static. Yeah. yeah. The way. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. I think we have a last question because you're talking a lot about how we, you are just as always inspiring me to be with Jesus and to learn with Him and to experience this living word in my life. But you know, many of us, we are leaders. We have so many noises around us, so many things that happening and some decisions and problems that we need to solve and people coming after us. Just let me see what, how can you be able to just say, hey, I'm not going to carry these things with me right now? How you can just, okay, now I'm going to play soccer or now I'm going to play tennis. How do you, you make this possible, this miracle? Because for me, sometimes it's just like, I, I'm trying to calm down, I'm trying to focus. In, how can you make it happen, Jimmy? Well, I... <laughs> If I try to do nothing, I can't do it. I, I just keep getting more and more wound up because I keep running it over and over and over and over through my mind. So I find that it helps me really a lot uh, to do something that totally absorbs my attention but doesn't really matter. That's what I get from sports. That's what I get from tying flies or painting a picture. Um, they, they're... They're very absorbing activities. You know, hours can go by, you don't even notice it. But but they're, they're, it doesn't really matter if you don't get it right. You know, I, I think, you know, go fishing or something. That's, mm -hmm. But don't, if you, if you just try to not do anything, it won't work. Mm -hmm. it, at least not for me, it doesn't. It makes me more tense than if I would just get on with it and try to resolve it. But there are many things in leadership that militate against the leader's health and sanity and spirituality. And so it, when you're in leadership, the busier you are, the more attention you need to pay to these things that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. If not, the job will eat you alive, mm -hmm. as, as we've seen it do to many of our colleagues. Mm. Yeah. And I think sometimes we forget we are embodied, right? Mm. I mean, that's that's where sports and, and that comes in as well, you know. it's Well, given my body, sometimes I'd like to forget it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, then you can paint, you know. But, <laughs> uh, but Jim, there's a, there's a question we all, always ask as well to all our guests, and uh, I think you'll be fine with it. Uh, it's our mistake question. So is there a mistake that you would like to share with us, you know, that we can learn from as well, that you learn from yourself? But just, um, you know. Uh, I, I've noticed that everybody wants to know about your mistakes nowadays. Yeah. That's, always, that's always the question in any interview, it seems like. And I'm not sure if it's because people like to see, oh, yeah, he's just like me. I can do it too. Or if they just like an excuse for making mistakes. But anyway. I think, I think for us, I think it's to see the humanity. <laughs> you have shared quite a bit of it. Uh, but... I've made plenty of mistakes. I, yeah. I think maybe the biggest one is um, I tend to get intensely focused on goals. And then if I'm not careful, I'll run over people if they get in the way. Yeah, so. Uh, that's one of the things that I really work on developing in my life is kindness because it's easy for me to be more like a, uh, you know, a bulldozer. 
and forget to be kind and sacrifice people to the, the goal that you're trying to reach. You don't want to make it too easy. Life is demanding. And if people don't take responsibility for their lives and you let them not take responsibility for their lives, you're not doing them any favors. That's not love. You're, you're encouraging them in an irresponsible uh, lifestyle and that's not going to serve them well. It's going to end up destroying them. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's okay to be demanding, but you have to be loving and kind. And then you can be insistent. But, and then I, I think for the first years of my ministry, I focused way too much on human responsibility Although I know people are responsible for their own lives. That's why we have to confess our sins. We have to assume responsibility for our lives. But I didn't talk enough about the divine resources that allow us to fulfill our responsibilities. Mm. No, that's good. That's what grace is too, isn't it? I mean, that's the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So it's like a... It's amazing that you understand that. When, when I listen to the songs and hear the messages nowadays, it sounds like grace is a is God living in denial. Uh, you know, like he kind of gave up and said, ah, well, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it really is. I, I just, I'm finishing up my first manuscript on a, a book on grace. And what I did is I took three weeks full time. All I did was meditate on the scriptures about grace. Mm -hmm. And... I found out that it's it does include forgiveness mm -hmm. and mercy, mm -hmm. but that's only the first step, and that's a real small minority mm -hmm. of what's said about grace in in the Bible. It's multifaceted, and if you were going to sum it up, it would be just what Tovi just said. It's it's that transforming power. Yeah, and, you know. Fantastic! I look forward to read that book. I must say, but um, talking about books. Kalinia. <laughs> yes, I want to just to let you know, guys, if you didn't hear, we d I didn't speak in the beginning, but Jimmy wrote three books, two books, and he organized another one. So I just wanted to encourage you before I ask him for some advice, what he's reading, but he wrote a book that is called Against All the Odds, that is the Why One is Brazil History. And he's writing right now this book about grace, but we have another one that's about faith, the way of faith thriving in your walk with God. And he also organized his kingdom come. But I'm not here to advertise your books, Jimmy. But that's I, okay. You can to... advertise them. Yeah, but I, I think it would be great just to let people know that they can yeah. read you. And mm -hmm. the book about faith, it's so simple, but so deep at the same time. And it's just inspirational. But we're not to be inspired by you, Jimmy, right now. And can you just recommend some books that about how we can learn about true spirituality or anything else that we are reading in these past few months? And we can just follow your advice and to be inspired. Books or other material that you wanted to share with us? Um. What I'm reading right now is a book by uh, uh, Wright. What, what initials does he use? He's calling himself Tom Wright now, but he's uh, a he Wright. Yeah, uh, called "The Day the Revolution Began." That's that's mm. a good book. It it um, I think it puts puts the spheres and all into a biblical context. It's very very good. You know that's a good one. I'm also reading a book. I'm, let's see here if I can find it so I can tell you the actual title about how the modern concept of self came about philosophically mm. in Western culture. Because that's the, I think that's the big challenge of uh, today's young people is that they get discipled by this concept of self that comes from um, secular humanism, but they don't know they've been discipled by it. So mm -hmm. the attitudes that seem right to them, if they were to actually take them, mm -hmm. them with the scriptures, it's shockingly different. 
It's this book is called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self mm -hmm. uh, by Carl uh, R. Truman. So those are some of the books that I'm reading. I would like to encourage people to read the book on faith, though. It I've gotten really, really uh, positive reviews on it from people that have read it. Uh, and it's not just to, you know, read another book, but I think it'll... The, the purpose of it isn't to say every. What happened was I'm walking through the publishing house in Seattle because I go visit them when I go visit my kids. And Tom Bragg said, we don't have a book on faith. I thought, what? Why am I? Not? So I impulsively said, I'll write you one. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I would get some stories and write some bridging text. And, you know, it'd be. But what happened is I started looking in the Bible and I went on this journey. Almost everything you hear said about faith or in the front is wrong. It, it, it's not like it's heresy or something, but it's just mm -hmm. off. It, it's so I, I think that book is will really help anybody because the just will shall live by faith. It's a marketing problem because everybody thinks they already know about faith. Mm -hmm. but we really don't. Mm -hmm. And, and, of course, the main purpose of faith is to unlock grace in our lives. For by grace are you saved through faith. Mm -hmm. um, like grace in our lives. Yeah. So I found I had to write, do a follow-up book on grace. Fantastic. Well, I would like both of them for Christmas or one for Christmas, and then it's my birthday in February, so maybe. <laughs> I was recently in the States to do staff conferences. I did three in a row. Wow. And I had, at the last place, I had 150 of the faith books sent. And I was going to bring whatever was left over to England so we could get them over here. Yeah. But we sold all of them. There weren't any left. So I need something else for Christmas then, Kalina. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's find a gift for you, Tova. Yeah. But thank you so much. This has been so, so rich, Jim. Um, I need to go over this. I listen to this interview myself because I, I tried to take notes here on the side and that didn't go so well. Uh, of, of just some nuggets you gave. Um, just here in closing, I wonder, I mean, now you're here with us in, in Europe, do you have any advice you would like to give to leaders in Europe, Byron, Byron leaders in Europe? My heart's been deeply moved by this time in England. We've been here since September. And I've been in many churches around London. And, and um, it, it's a real challenge. Uh, the challenge of Europe is secular humanism, mm -hmm. and yeah. and uh, it's that's a very demonic thing that's been laid down for hundreds of years now, layer by layer, in Western cultures. That the devil's long-term thinker, yeah, mm -hmm. and implicational thinking, and uh, it's a very real spiritual battle. I guess if I was going to say one thing is don't take it on as a philosophical bet. Well, you know, some people have that calling, so go ahead. But I'm what I'm saying is essentially it's a spiritual bet. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, a, it's a web of lies that's very hard to untangle, but you can cut through it by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and by uh, the power of God through your life mm -hmm. and, and so it, i encourage you just become really really alive in jesus make that your absolute priority and i think the rest will follow yeah. that's a good advice so <laughs> please be praying for us in europe as well you know and and, and stay around and teach because i think uh, you you don't recognize the water you swim in right of the river you swim in, the culture, what you're breathing every day, what you hear every day. So I think uh, we need some counterculture really to, to, to realize and to point out the water we swim in, I think. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so good. Yeah. But we want to thank both of you, Brazilians. <laughs> I think you're a Brazilian heart, Jim. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you, Kalinia, for joining. That was fun. Um, I know that you are looking at starting something like the ELC yeah. or ALC that you have in Asia, in your part of the woods. So, um, so you're just thrown into the deep here. 
Um, but thank you so much, Jim. It was just such an honor and joy having you here. Um, and I'd love to have you back sometime. Sure. It's a great yeah. pleasure. Yeah, thank you. I remember it's a joy seeing you out on the cross country skiing trails in the year 2000. And All right. So I, 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 mean, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't see her for very long because she'd kind of go <laughs> and she'd be gone and I'm struggling along. But anyway. Yeah, so I did the LTS. And Jim, he was just pulling my leg for days on end because there's rumors that Danes, they are not very good at skiing. <laughs> Which is true in general. Uh, but uh, then we went skiing and, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. For a Dane, you know, you're pretty good. <laughs> well, thank you, Jim. Thank you. I just wanted to get this out here. So now we can end. <laughs> here, so that's great. <laughs> Such a good, good compliment. Thank you so much. It was a joy to be with you. And Jimmy, always a pleasure to learn from you. Yes. So thank you. And have a fantastic rest of Advent and, and Christmas coming up. So For you too. You. Yeah. Um, that's Bye. 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 Happy holidays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.